Last week in our sermon series on living and dying in Christ, we talked about death and grieving. And I promised that we would get to resurrection this week. So as promised, today we are focusing on what comes next. What happens after we die? What kind of eternal life does God promise us? What kind of resurrection are we talking about? Where? When? How? We are not the first people to ask these questions, and we will not be the last. But there's also not really an FAQ section anywhere in the Bible to give us a single comprehensive answer. We get snippets here and there across the New Testament in response to specific questions or conversations. Some chunks of scripture even have competing visions of what eternal life might look like for us. We'll talk about all that after worship. So without getting too far into the weeds, today we're going to look at a few key promises about the eternal kingdom of God that can help shape our hope, our expectation, our joy. One, our eternal selves will still be us. Two, we will live eternally with God. And three, this eternal life will be good and joyous. Now, if you've been in the church for a while, this sounds like the bare minimum, right? But I promise you, these promises are more radical than you might think. We've already heard from the Gospel of John, and now we're going to jump into 1 Corinthians, where Paul is in the middle of a larger conversation about resurrection, saying that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so will we be raised. Then he takes on one of the most common questions. What about our bodies? <coughs> This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as far as what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat, or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of heaven, the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. Indeed, star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Apostles' Creed ends with what I like to call the Holy Spirit list. All of the things that the Holy Spirit makes possible for us. In this life and in the next. It goes like this. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The resurrection of the body, you say. Whose body? Jesus' body? <laughs> My body? If you were here last November, you might remember our sermon series on the social, political, religious context of Jesus' life and ministry. You might remember that we talked a little bit about Plato and Platonist philosophy and its influence. One of the hallmarks of Platonism is a concept called dualism, a belief that the soul and the body were separate but connected entities. They believed that the soul was the true essence of a person and the body was just the soul's gross earthly prison. The soul, unlike the body, was capable of perceiving capital T truth, but it was polluted by its connection to the body. And that capital T truth became twisted if you could only sense it through the five bodily senses. Only in death, they said, when the soul could return to its higher spiritual form outside the body, could the truth truly be discovered. Now, when we look at this passage from 1 Corinthians, we can see some hints of that dualism when Paul calls the first body, or the physical body, temporary, dishonorable, weak, while the second spiritual body is eternal, glorious, and powerful. But at the same time, Paul also rejects dualism's major premise, that only the spiritual can be good. The glory of an earthly body and a heavenly body are different, he says, but each is glorious and wonderful in its own way. It can be tempting to say that our earthly lives and our earthly bodies, which are temporary, finicky, and impermanent, are unimportant in the light of what, a, what is eternal. But that's not what Paul says here at all. We do not become disembodied souls or Casper the Friendly Ghost when we die. We are fundamentally embodied creatures. And even in eternity, we will have eternal bodies. And so we learn that these two lives, the temporary physical life and the eternal spiritual life, are inextricably intertwined. The eternal is not a redo, a starting over, not, eh, that was a nice first try, but here's the real thing kind of scenario. What is permanent, what is eternal, is instead the fulfillment, the fullness, the glorifying of what God has already created and shaped and loves. Us. We become new creations in Christ, but we do not lose ourselves in that new creation. And it's precisely because God created us, shaped us, and loves us that we also get to trust that this eternal life will be spent in the presence of God. This is what Jesus promises us in the passage from John, that he has gone to prepare a space in God's house where we might live eternally with him. A lot of world religions believe in reincarnation, the idea that a single soul is reborn in different bodies over and over and over again. Others believe that the soul scatters to become one with the universe. Still other, others believe that nothing at all comes after death. But we, we get to trust that Jesus is bringing us directly into the home of God. No security screenings needed. Did you know that in many black church traditions in North America, lots of folks use the phrase homegoing servants instead of the word funeral? It's a practice that goes all the way back to the 1600s, when the first enslaved people were brought to North America. 
Many believed that when they died, their souls returned home to Africa. For them, death meant freedom. As their descendants and other enslaved peoples encountered and adopted Christianity, they kept that same language of going home. But it came to mean going home to God. To this day, in many African American churches, homegoing services are still the norm. We are saying goodbye, but we are sending our beloveds home. Last week, I reminded us that we are allowed to be sad when someone we love dies. We are allowed to grieve that loss. I also need to tell you, though, that there's an and to be had here. Not a but, an and. And you are allowed to rest in the comfort that the people you love are experiencing the joy of that place Jesus has prepared for them. Eating at Jesus' table, family dinner stuff. Maybe engaging in some healthy debate with the Apostle Paul about the intricacies of his writings. Their faith has become sight, and their prayer has become praise, and it is okay to say thanks be to God for that. Romans 8, not Romans 8, Romans 6 says, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Can y'all imagine a life without death? A life without medical bills? A world without the need for hospice care or emergency rooms? Without a constant barrage of mass shooting reports? Without fear, without pain, without corruption, without war? A world where love and joy and compassion rule the day. Where everyone has plenty to eat and a space to live and clean water and people speak and worship face to face with God. When you mash all of those images of the kingdom of God from scripture together, that's the kind of world you end up with. Maybe it seems a little too good to be true. Maybe some part of you is throwing up red flags like, is she starting a cult? <laughs> I think because we hear it so often, we forget how radical this idea can truly be. That not only are we promised eternal life with God, but it's a good, joyous, enough kind of life. The Bible can be complicated, with all of its metaphors and allegories and parables. But these promises rest at the core of our faith. In Christ, death itself has lost its sting. United with him in baptism, we die with him and we are resurrected with him to eternal good life in the kingdom of God. In Christ, friends, even death, even death, leads us to life, love, and joy. Thanks be to God.